Welcome to the Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I am one of your co-hosts, Derek Anderson, and I am so thrilled today to be joined by a very special guest. You know her as one of the co-hosts of Corpse Club. You know her as the managing editor of DailyDead.com. And quite recently, you may also know her as the author of Monsters, Makeup, and Effects, Conversations with Cinema's Greatest Artists, Volume 2, the sequel to the first volume that came out last year from Dark Inc., an imprint of AM Inc. Publishing. And you can get Volume 2 right now in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Heather, thank you so much for joining me today, and congratulations on the release of your new book. Thank you, Derek. Everybody loves, everybody needs a sequel. If, if nothing else, that's what Scream taught me. So, you know, I had to be ready to, to, to unleash a sequel and then we're going to turn it into a quadrilogy eventually. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, Corpse Club listeners know that you love Scream 4 and have, you know, really shouted from the mountaintops about that movie probably longer than anyone else I know. So I think a quadrilogy is is perfect because then we can get your your take on on a fourth film in a franchise. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels right. It just feels right, I think, at this point. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, uh, volume two came out uh, October 26th, almost to the day of the release of uh, Monsters Makeup and Effects Volume 1. So that was nice. And now I have a lot of work ahead of me to make sure I can hit sort of the same timeline for volume three. Um, yeah, so it's 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 been incredible. It's been a really long journey, but it's been a lot of fun. And just seeing people react to stuff has been really great so far. Yeah, I just love what you've done with these books, because what you're really doing is like shining the spotlight on the people behind the scenes of some of cinema's biggest horror and sci-fi movies and these amazing creations that people remember, but they might not know the stories of these makeup effects and special effects artists that help bring all these, all this movie magic to life. Um, and so in the first uh, volume, you did 20 chapters on 20 different special effects artists and these fascinating conversations. It was, and it was a really stellar lineup. And now you, you go from that, uh, you've done like a lot of homework with that first volume. And now here you are with 20 additional chapters. And I, I just love it because when I was reading the first volume, I heard like, there's all these names that you hear of other makeup artists and, and the stuff that they did because it's all so intertwined. And so I was like, Oh, I want to hear more about their stories too, which is exactly what you did in this volume. So what was that like for you to like, kind of even go dive even further? And was there, was it, like challenging to kind of narrow it down or like try to figure out who you wanted to highlight in the second volume or did it kind of happen organically when you were talking to all these artists? Yeah, I, you know, I think sort of the process kind of started off initially for me was like when I first started this whole journey, like six and a half years ago now, um, uh, for me, we'd already really heard a lot from like the, the likes of like Rick Baker um, Stan Winston and you know some of the other bigger names out there um, and so I wanted to kind of like shift the focus a little bit to folks that maybe people hadn't heard a lot from and then also for me what I, I did was is because for me like most of us one of the biggest things I think that draws a lot of horror fans in are characters and creatures mm -hmm. and monsters and things like that. So for me, it was almost like I created this list of like all of like my favorite creatures and monsters and that kind of stuff. And, you know, kind of started drawing those lines of like, okay, you know, I love Pennywise from the original it miniseries, you know, okay, I need to go talk to Bart Mixon then, you know, oh, yeah. I, I still think that, the effects you know from the the brundle fly effects from the fly are some of my very favorites you know monstrosity creature kind of things transformational creature if you will you know i need to get in touch with chris wayless um and so it was kind of like that where it was almost like you know when i joke and tell people like this is like me like living out my dream or like it's almost like christmas for me it really is because it really was me finding like all of these people who worked on 
all these amazing things that made me fall in love with horror, science fiction, and even movies beyond sort of the genre realm too, where, you know, I was just like, you know, I want to talk to these people. I want to hear their stories. And it, and it really all kind of came about because of one of the iterations of Stan Winston week that we did on daily dead, um, where I decided to do a piece sort of on Stan as like, not even just as like a sh- like a business owner and like a shop person, like who he was to the people that worked for him longest. Um, because there was a lot of people who worked at the Stan Winston studios who were called lifers. And basically they came in at Stan's and they never left. Like the only reason that some of these folks left is because Stan, you know, sadly passed away um, and they had to shut down the business. And that's how legacy effects started. Um And, you know, so I started asking, you know, folks questions about Stan when I was interviewing about other things like Predator and stuff like that. And I remember somebody saying to me, and I don't remember exactly who it was, but they said to me, they're like, you know, nobody's ever asked me this kind of stuff before. And I was like, really? And they're (laughs) like, yeah, like we only really get like questions about like, well, how did you make this? What did you do for this? And, you know, just, you know, those sort of more technical questions. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. that's a real shame because like, that's part of, you know, film history for me, you know, it's, yeah, it's a business and it's a product that we all enjoy, you know, on, on the most basic level, but ultimately yeah. it's these people, you know, in all facets of filmmaking that like come together, they, they put their personal lives on hold in a lot of cases. And like, you know, put forth all this creative energy to create the stuff that we enjoy. And I'm like, I feel like that needs to be celebrated. It needs to be, you know, discussed more in depth, you know, beyond what I could just do on a website. And so that was kind of how it all came about. Um, And, you know, it was just one of those things where like, I, I just realized I was like, yeah, nobody's really done this kind of stuff before. And you know, so I just kind of like, as, as I started off with this and, you know, because you've been part of this journey since the beginning, um, you know, <laughs> I, I started off with my initial 20 interviews that I did originally back for monster squad, but I still had mm-hmm. a ton of folks that I wanted to talk to. And so I just kept reaching out to people cause I'm a glutton for punishment and I don't know how to stop working, <laughs> um, which is something I think most people know about me. Like, honestly, if you follow me on Twitter, like I'm either, you know, it's either me rambling about some <laughs> random movie or I'm talking about the fact that I'm still working because I'm always working. <laughs> I'm going to get out of that path <laughs> one of these days. Um, but it was just one of those where it was just like the more I would talk to people, the more excited I would get and the more stories I wanted mm-hmm. to collect and the more artists I wanted to champion because I just didn't feel like we'd really seen anything like this. And then once everything sort of evolved into the Monsters Makeup and Effects series, you know, I was still collecting interviews and things like that. And, you know, realistically, like I think volumes three and four are probably going to go over 20 chapters because I think I have like 83 interviews. Oh, wow. Um, total. And honestly, like there's still people I would love to talk to, but I'm just like, <laughs> all right, just hold on. Let's just get through <laughs> the ones you have and figure it out from there because, you know, you got to you, you got to take a breath. Um, Because again, this has been six and a half years of my life. By the time, you know, volumes three and four come out, that's almost nine years. Like, I need a little bit of a breather. (laughs) You know, I'm just like, (laughs) I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm a glutton for punishment, but maybe I need to sort of take a, take a step back for myself for a little bit, but you know, who knows? But yeah, it's just, it's like, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, I think of all these things that like, you know. Again, I'm going to drop Chris Wayless' name, but it was like when I was a kid, there was like when when I was introduced to Gizmo, like that changed my life. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, I mean, that was like a creature that was like just so organic and fun. And how do you not fall in love with that character? And I needed every Gizmo doll and a T-shirt and all this. And I'm like, <laughs> so it's like being able to like celebrate the work of Chris and his team on that movie. Like, of course, I want I want you know, to be able to do that kind of stuff. So it it really is like, I know it sounds like so cliche and like such BS, but like, it literally feels like with every interview that it's like a whole new dream coming true for me. Um, because honestly, my whole career has just always been about, you know, telling other people's stories. 
um, that's what I love. That's what I, I, that's what brought me into this in the first place. So being able to do this, you know, really has just meant a lot to me. And the fact that these people trusted me, you know, has been a huge honor. Well, yeah, you've definitely done right by them and, you know, given them a platform that, like you mentioned, I don't think really there has been to this extent, like a celebration going of their specific careers and going in depth like you do, where you go back to like when they were first making stuff in their garages or like reading uh, like Fangoria and Starlog and like what inspired them to, you know, personally want to even get into like makeup effects and special effects because it's it's amazing like just hearing the origin story it's kind of like each chapter is a little like a, a movie for each of these artists where you kind of get to see how they go from like point a to like where they are now which is in some cases like oscar winning effects work which is just amazing it's kind of i imagine you have like a yarn chart of like all these different artists and it keeps getting bigger and bitter because you're <laughs> trying to connect all the dots and you know it's it's just so cool to read that and i think what's really interesting too about volume two is that you have a lot of artists featured in this volume that were influenced and mentored by artists that you interviewed in volume one uh people like screaming mad george alec gillis tom woodruff jr howard berger and a lot of others like they were mentors and inspirations to a lot of the people that you interviewed in volume two. So it's kind of like this, it feels like a, it, it does feel like a sequel in that way where you're continuing almost like Pat, seeing how those artists influenced a whole other like generation of, of makeup effects artists. Yeah. It's the, the industry in general is just, it, it it's so for as much as there's like the sense of competition because everybody wants to work, everybody needs to make money to live and things like that. Like there's just such a, a sense of togetherness through that you know I sort of felt from a lot of these artists in terms of like the way that they would talk about other artists that they worked with whether they were mentors or people sort of in the trenches with them you know throughout these different experiences um and yeah it's it's interesting I kind of turn you know at certain points I do sort of turn into that Charlie Day meme where like I'm like <laughs> all right I mean there's like there's a joke like I, I recently chatted with the folks at Dead Ringers and we there's this joke where literally it's like who didn't work on Gremlins to the new batch Oh my gosh like that that was like one of the most massive special effects shows in modern film history because it was 16 months I think they had a crew of like 150 some odd people working at Rick Baker's uh Cinovation Studios like everybody <laughs> like practically like I'm always surprised when somebody hasn't worked on Gremlins 2, where I'm just like, all right, cool. And, but the thing is, it's like for as many people who did work on Gremlins 2, nobody has the same stories, which is kind of amazing right. because, you know, certain people were involved with different aspects of it. You know, certain people had different Gremlins and things like that. And, you know, somebody like Kazuhiro, who's in book two, like he was kind of Rick Baker's like second in command. So his experiences would be very different from like somebody like who's like Steve Wang, who did like the spider gremlin, or um, I think it was Gabe Bartalis, who's in the first book, who did the veggie gremlin. And, you know, it's like, so everybody <laughs> has like these all fun little anecdotes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I literally, it's like, it's like you could play six degrees of gremlins too in the effects industry, where it's like, it's the Kevin Bacon of, of movie effects like shows where like everything can connect back to it. Like, oh even my today. gosh. Yeah. And it's, I, I was going to yeah, say also too, like, yeah, I was also going to say too, like in terms of like sort of figuring out like who to talk to and stuff like that, like, you know, obviously there was like bucket list things for me, but I also did want to like try to find folks who have like not the typical experiences. Like, mm -hmm. like for example, like in book one, like one of the people that I talked to was Tom Berman, who for me, the first time seeing Planet of the Apes as a kid um blew my mind and then of course realizing Roddy McDowell was in it I was just like oh my god like this is the greatest thing ever um but he was a guy who like he was in the industry one still working with somebody like Jack Pierce who wow like we wouldn't have makeup effects like without Jack Pierce and then but also he was in the industry at a time where like you didn't have a shop you worked for a studio specifically um, which I thought was a really interesting perspective to kind of give people a sense of the history of the effects industry, because there was a time where like, 
you would go in and you basically would just get hired by a studio and you would just work all of their different shows, whether it was television or movies. And you would just kind of like go around to all these different like projects and just be constantly working. Um, I think it was a little bit that way too, for somebody like Stan Winston. Like I think he did a bunch of stuff with Disney very early in his career and then realized like, Oh no, this is, this is terrible. Um, because I think they were fighting him on like credits for gargoyles or something like that. And he was like, no, this is not how this works. And he was one of the first guys to like open up his own studio. Um, which, you know, at the time that he did that, nobody was really doing that. Like even in the early eighties, late seventies, like it wasn't like Rick Baker had a studio. It was just like, you know, he would get hired as an artist. He'd, you know, bring in some friends to help him out and they were working out of his garage. And then on the weekends, like everybody would hang out in each other's garages, drinking and sharing stories and stuff like that. And then I think once Stan, because Stan was very business minded, like showed that like, oh yeah, you can start a studio and, you know, the production studios will come to you and hire your business to like come in and do these things. That was like, oh, and that was like this whole different shift where suddenly Rick Baker was starting his own studio and, you know, and like even like dick smith on the east coast who of course is a legend too it oh, wasn't yeah. like he had a traditional studio either like his his like studio in like shop was out of his house like he never had wow. like a business like it was like in his house like i forget who it was um this might be an in, this might have been from monster squad and it might show up in It'll definitely show up in a later uh, edition of Monsters Makeup and Effects, but um, like they did like live casting for Goldie Hawn in his basement. For oh, Death yes. Her, you know, so it's yep. like, yeah, it was just that's just how it worked, you know, for a lot of people for a long time. So it's just it's for me, it's, you know, every interview is like an education because I learned something new about the industry. I learned something new about how things have evolved you know, how people work with each other. It's, it, it's just really fascinating. Like that's the kind of stuff that I think is really interesting. Um, and especially with like somebody like Tom Berman, who again, you know, got into this industry in the sixties, you know, like that everything is so completely different now than it was back then. And so I wanted to give people sort of a sense of that, um, which I honestly think is the, the biggest reason for me is why I led off the entire series of monsters makeup and effects with him because to me it was like that was like we know how it is now this is how it used to be um and i just thought there was something really really interesting about that that is fascinating because it's showing like the evolution of the makeup effects studio and how they kind of got their independence from you know just being kind of married to one studio like now they can lend their expertise to any number of studios and actually, you know, make a living off of it and like have more creative freedom. And it's, it, that is amazing because I don't think a lot of people really realize how much it has changed in such a short amount of time too. Um, and, you know, and then of course there was the kind of the evolution of like the visual effects and how does that, you know, like this, I remember in, in the book, um, there's moments where like, you know, when Jurassic Park came out and, and some of the, the makeup artists were worried that that would be the end of like practical effects. But f people like Phil Tippett kind of found a way to utilize like both of those worlds and and it actually like enhanced their careers in, in some ways. So I think it's they're like always having to evolve like the the that industry is so like changing so quickly. But somehow like these artists just find a way to keep going and make a living at it and still like keeping the practical effects alive, even though we're in a very digital age now. Yeah. I think also too, that a lot of that comes from the fact that we have a lot of filmmakers now who grew up at the, you know, loving practical effects, falling in love with movies, be, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of instances because of practical effects. So I think a lot of them want to champion them as much as possible. And I think one of the biggest sort of like purveyors of like modern filmmakers who did that. Well, I think there's two, I think it's James Wan and Guillermo del Toro, um, oh, yeah. especially Guillermo because he has like the, the background in special effects. Um, but I think because of those guys, like I think they started to show studios again, that practical effects might take some extra time 
might take mm-hmm. a little extra money, but like they're worth it. Like you, you, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who's anti-digital because the reality is, is like, especially these days for as amazing as practical effects are, chances are the reason that they are so amazing is because they have digital enhancements. Like everybody loves the Chucky TV series and that's, um, you know, and it's totally due to the uh, amazing work that Tony Gardner and his crew do on that show. But you're also forgetting that there's a ton of digital artists who are rotoscoping out, you know, puppeteers and wires and things like that, that help sell those effects even more. And, that you know, is- it's like, you know, and they had, it's, it's, it, it all goes hand in hand, really. Yeah, that's the thing that I think you, especially reading like the, you know, the Phil Tippett chapter and just the different perspectives of of the artists who were able to adapt is like you know we don't have like they don't have to be enemies with the visual artists like they can those two worlds can coexist and you know there's a lot of stuff from the 90s and the 2000s where they were kind of figuring out like okay how do we you know we we still need makeup artists and we're always going to need makeup artists and but like you said they can actually coexist and enhance each other and you know we don't we don't have to like it doesn't have to be the end for either one so it's it's really interesting hearing that because it does it did seem like when when digital effects first started it was almost like a doomsday kind of bell for some people where they're like is this the end but obviously we've seen that uh you know you can't you can't beat in camera effects and you know they can coexist and you know it's all good so (laughs) yeah and i think it's also too it's like you you also need to have digital artists who support the work of practical effects because if you don't then you end up with you know the situation that like the thing the thing prequel came about you know uh, ended up experiencing yep, yep. where like you know tom and alec went into that project and basically were told by the digital team that they, they were like oh we're gonna make sure like it's our work you see in this movie not yours and we got what mm. we got because of that um so you need you know I, I think there's a lot more people in that work in like digital effects these days that understand that their work is to enhance you know the practical stuff but i also think that in terms of like creating digital characters you know i think that there are instances where it works like you know and this is something i've i've brought up too in conversations where like honestly like having josh brolin as thanos in practical makeup that's that's not going to work it just isn't (laughs) like you're not going to like that is not that's going to look goofy it's going to look like something out of like the incredible hulk tv series which has a certain charm but it just doesn't work for modern storytelling sensibilities it just doesn't but you create that character digitally the way that you know they have that sells that character so much more like you know it's it's tough because it's like I think, you know, Marvel gets a lot of crap for, you know, a lot of stuff. But like, I think what I've appreciated about a lot of those movies is especially like the James Gunn ones is like they found a really great way of like creating compelling digital characters, but also highlighting the the benefits of using practical effects where like you see it on Drax and, you know, and you see it on Gamora, you know, but you oh, also yeah. have, you know why can't i think of the god darn tree oh root. root oh my god or rocket you know what i mean like so <laughs> there, there is lot. this happy place where like these things can meet and like just make each other better and more fun um you know so i'm not somebody who is completely anti-digital because i think that's so short-sighted um and the reality is is like you know you want to say that you're like all you know totally about practical effects but reality is these days like chances are your practical effects have some sort of digital enhancement to them. But the beauty of it is, is when they're so good, you don't even know it. And that's, that's the benefit of being able to rely on digital technology, you know, you always need something in camera. So I think like, did you, have you seen werewolves by night yet? I have not. I really want to though. Okay. I'm not going to ruin anything about it, but they, in, in that show, they have, man thing which is like the big creature oh, yes. kind of cthulhu character um and what i love about that and it was michael giacchino like he talked about this when we were at fantastic fest how you know they knew 
ultimately that that character was was going to end up digital right because like Mm -hmm. it's a massive character there's it needs to move in certain ways that practical just wasn't going to totally achieve but because he knew he still needed the scale he knew that he still needed something for the actors to react off of they actually created this like eight to ten foot suit that somebody wore on set (laughs) so that people could still interact with it and to me that is genius because I think that's like another way that like really shows you how practical effects can benefit a project in a way that you may not be expecting, but then also like ends up pushing the digital even further, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. So you're not just reacting to like a tennis ball or something. It's like you have something real to react to, which is, that's awesome to hear that there's like, they're putting that passion and that time into creating something that's authentic, even if, you know, it is ultimately going to be digital. It's still important, I think, to have that, that realism on set and like have like you are on the set of Gremlins too, where you do see everything happening, but it's like you, you're trying to kind of marry the two, which I think is, you know, really good. And I'm hoping, you know, I think we're getting a new appreciation for practical effects too, in the last you know, decade, as you mentioned, like people that grew up on these movies are filmmakers now, and they're realizing like the importance of, of keeping practical effects front and center, but doesn't mean you can't dabble a little bit in digital and, and enhance it. So um, it's, it's, it's awesome. And, you know, it's, it's amazing uh, too. like, uh, you know, I had a just an awesome time reading volume two and there's so in addition to all the, the amazing anecdotes and the, uh, just the these stories from behind the scenes of these movies. There's hundreds of behind the scenes photos of how they made these creations and like the puppeteers and everything on set. I mean, that's that in itself is a massive undertaking. Just like assembling all these photos, like getting them, like deciding what goes in. But what is that like for you when you're kind of putting this book together and like how how does that how is that process of like getting these photos and seeing them for the first time. And like, I mean, that's just a lot to go through in itself. (laughs) Honestly, like it might almost be harder to do that stuff than it is the interviews. And I'll be honest, like the interview, like getting like locking down interviews sometimes can be really tricky because, you know, a lot of these folks, you know, they, most of them are still active in the industry. So they're still off working like on shows and movies and things like that. So scheduling can always be tricky. There's been certain Mm. artists where it's like, I've had to do their interviews in like several parts because of their schedules and things like that. Um, And then it's like one of those things because, you know, the one thing that I make sure I do is like when I write a chapter, you know, I always let people review it and let them send me back notes. And then usually then my next thing is like, when I do that, I'm like, oh, you know, if you can send me materials and blah, blah, blah. And then that's when everybody starts to go radio silent because it's not as like an imperative for them. And I'm just like, oh no, no, I need this still, please. Thank you. <laughs> where it can be really tricky where I'm just like, please. Um, you know, so it, 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 it can be really time consuming. And then it's also then, but then there's also like the artist who will send you over like 200 photos. And I'm just like, okay, well, I don't need this many, but now I have to go through (laughs) and figure out which ones I want to use and find the right balance and make sure like, you know, that I'm not going too heavy on one movie versus another, but oh, but all this stuff looks really cool. Um, You know, because also like I have to like not play favorites because it's like there's certain movies where I'm like, oh my God, I'm like seeing like a hundred, you know, photos from Friday, but like we only need like probably four or five, you know, because we have to cover these like 12 other movies and stuff. So it's like, it it is like this little bit of a dance, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but I think, you know, for me, it's like being able to share that stuff is really cool. Um, You know, and realistically, a lot of this stuff, you know, does live on the internet to a degree because a lot of folks like they've, they've under finally sort of over the last, 10 to 20 years of started to understand the importance of archiving Oh because you know once it's gone it's gone um and you know and for a lot of them they'll just put a lot of this stuff up on their websites but for me it's like at least I feel like I'm pulling it all together in a way where it just feels like it's been collected um so that way you don't have to just like go and like try to find something randomly like it's here um 
but it can be, it can be kind of a pain. And then also there's, there's sometimes where I'll get photos where I'm just like, I, this is super cool and I want to include it. I have no idea what this is because there's no like file name that tells me the movie, like where it's just like, you know, oh, wow. you know, 1408. And you're just like, what? I love that. By the way, I just picked 1408. We're out of, out of randomly, like I'm in the Stephen King movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But it's just like, I'm like, oh, this is a super cool creature. And I'm just like, I don't know what this is from. Okay. <laughs> and then it's like, so I'll try to email them. But then it's like, if they're busy, I may not hear back from them. So then mm -hmm. I'm like, I'll have to do like a Google image search. Most of the times, you know, those don't work. Because if it's not a human face, Google has problems like recognizing these things. So it's, you know, I will say like, it took a lot of, it probably took me like two weeks to get all the photos and stuff done for volume two. Volume one was a little easier for some reason, but for some reason, volume two just took quite a bit of time. Well, and there's such a, like a wide range, like of eras too. Like you have stuff from the like late seventies and early eighties, but then you also have like, on like for super indie movies, like deadly spawn, but then you have like the plan of the apes remake from uh, like the early two thousands and men in black and like I, you know it made it makes you realize too like seeing how much went into some of those late 90s early 2000s movies where i was i just kind of assumed that more was done digitally but like man even the planet of the apes remake there was so much done on the, like with makeup effects that it just kind of blew my mind to see those photos and like realize all the work that went into that movie even though not everyone like remembers the remake you know as fondly as the original planet of the apes but it was it was kind of fascinating just to see like all those different eras like throughout a an artist's career yeah and that's the thing too like i will never defend the planet of the apes movie um and this is even <laughs> something that i've heard in interviews where like that's not even the movie tim burton set out to make um and in, in fact I'm, if i'm if i'm not mistaken i swear that it, it was supposed to be James Cameron doing it years prior because I have wow. test images of Matt Rose in makeup for Rick Baker um, oh when they were first putting makeups together, probably like five years before that even happened, the Tim Burton version. Um, oh. But I'm pretty sure James Cameron was supposed to initially do it for Fox. And, you know, so I will never, I, as a movie, I could never defend the Planet of the Apes remake. I mean, it's it's not the worst remake I've ever seen, but, you know, at the same time, I'm just like, eh, whatever. But I will say <laughs> that it's probably some of the best makeup effects of the 2000s that anybody has ever seen. Like the the way that they were able to build upon the foundation of the original makeups from the 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 original planet of the apes movie but you know again it's one of those things also too that people don't you know may not realize is like silicone is a is a material that changed everything for every for mm. the industry and so back you know in the original planet of the apes you had just you know rubber masks because that's what was available whereas now you know Rick Baker and his crew could rely on silicone, which is much more flexible. It looks more natural. You can really sculpt it in a way that you just couldn't before. Mm -hmm. And that's why those make up shine. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's one of the, actually, I came across the Planet of the Apes remake on TV earlier this year and I watched about 10 minutes of it. And, but strictly it was just because like, Tim Roth was on my TV and just looked freaking phenomenal. And I was like, I was completely <laughs> drawn in, not because it's a particularly great movie, but because that makeup just is astounding. And they're all fantastic. Like there, there's, there is not a bad makeup in that entire movie because, you know, Rick Baker is a perfectionist. He, anything that would have shown a scene and it wouldn't have mattered in what kind of character it was, whether it was like a secondary character, a completely, totally background character. If it had a scene, it wasn't going in. Um, and that's why, like, I, you know, and again, it's one of those, like, when I think of like movies that have that kind of scale of makeup, like another one is the Grinch. Oh yes. Where that is yeah. a movie where literally every single person in that movie is in makeup. Wow. And the, the, it's like, it's mind blowing when you think about that, there is not a character in that entire movie other than the dog who isn't <laughs> in makeup of some sort because every single who has makeup the grinch has makeup 
And, and that, all of it is flawless. It's absolutely flawless. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing looking back at that era and like Rick Baker and his team at Cinovation Studios in the late 90s, early 2000s. Like that was, those were some major show, like showcases of, of makeup effects. I mean, I, it, it, and I kind of almost feel, cause I grew up watching, you know, those movies and they just were on TV all the time. And I think like I took for granted just how much detail he put into it because it was still like that era of like, you know, Cinovation, you know, he was still working on a lot of stuff. And like you had these shops that, you know, came about in the eighties that were still doing, you know, still doing uh work with those original teams. And like, that is some really good stuff. Even like the, um, like the Godzilla remake, if we want to continue down the remake road, like there's some impressive, uh, you know, work in there, even though it's not, again, it's not like a movie that everyone is going to remember fondly, but it's, it's kind of amazing. Like, you know, just how much work went into those movies. Like, as you mentioned, years worth of, of preparation for those shows. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing too. It's like, I will never discount a movie because I don't te technically love the movie. If it's got amazing effects, like it's going to get talked about. Um, and Godzilla is definitely one of those Patrick Topolis and the work that he was able to do uh, in that movie with that kind of scale and being somebody who bare like barely had a shop. Like, Oh my gosh. He, he, what, you know, I mean, he basically met Roland, you know, on Stargate. And, you know, they just, they got along so well that they worked together, if, if, you know, for a few years. And it wasn't like Patrick, you know, was well established like the Rick Bakers and the Stan Winstons and the Savinis and things like that. Like, you know, he had to like rent a warehouse and find a crew and, you know, find a place to build like this 50 foot Godzilla thing, you know, creature. And, <laughs> and then it was like, all of a sudden, you know, they're literally like, six weeks before they start shooting the movie and Roland's like, what if we have, what if we have eggs? And, and Patrick's like, what? Like, okay, <laughs> we're going to build Godzilla eggs now. Like, what is that going to look like? Um, you know, I mean, again, it's like one of those, like where, I mean, it's a movie I love and I know people hate it and it's totally fine. Um, but like something like the super Mario brothers movie to me, like, still i love the makeup effects in that movie and i will still talk about them and champion them i know the movie is kind of goofy and probably one of the most hated i want to say out of the 90s if not all time i i always hear crap about it but at the same time i'm like there's just something about like the innovation that went into those creatures and like creating the goombas and king koopa and things like that where i'm just like you turned you know Dennis uh oh my god why can't I oh Hopper Dennis Hopper into like a giant yep. lizard king like of course <laughs> how do I resist that I don't I just don't I give into it so you know I mean when we talk about like those kind of movies like there's like the garbage pail kids which you know as a kid who grew up in the 80s like <laughs> I can't even tell you how excited I was about that movie and I'll be honest when I was a kid I loved that movie I don't think it's held up very well um but there's something to be said about what John Beekler and his crew were able to do with those characters. They really took these characters that had been like create, like created for like a 2d medium and brought them into 3d and actualized them in just such a really fun way that like, you know, if you don't love the movie, that's cool, but you can't deny how great those effects are. Yeah, they they come to a life uh, in a way all their own. And that's what's so special, too, about looking back at those movies where it's like they really had to just, you know, bring that to life with practical effects and just hope that it looked as realistic or surreal or whatever angle they were going for as possible. And, you, you know, you mentioned with that movie in particular, John Carl Beekler and, you know, what, who, you know, sadly, uh, John passed away in 2019 uh, from cancer. But uh, what one of the great things I think you do with volume two is you have a remembrance chapter in honor of John and you talked with a lot, you know, other makeup artists that got their start in John's shop, as well as like Kane Hodder, who's, you know, career as an actor kind of really took off because John believed in him and, and wanted him to play Jason in Friday the 13th part seven, the new blood, which he directed as well. Um, so I, I just, how important was it for you to, you know, take a, take an entire chapter and really remember John and like talk to the people that, 
you know, were his friends and colleagues and just kind of give him that spotlight. Because I think when you look back at that era, uh, there's a lot that John had his fingerprints on and in terms of like building up careers and making these really memorable effects that people still talk about to this day. Yeah, with with John, he was somebody who I initially had reached out to way back when I first started everything. Um, and we had connected and then he kind of fell off. And it was honestly, I just I didn't know that he was sick. I didn't know how sick he was. Um, but, you know, I'd always admired him and respected him. And especially because he created, I think, my favorite iteration of Jason, too. Um no offense, Brian Christopher, I don't love part seven as a movie, but I think it is the best designed Jason. Um, there's just something about that design that's just like, it, it's it's amazing. Um, and one of the things, like when we talk about sort of the three lines throughout a lot of these interviews, you know, I would say at least like 50 to 60% of the people that I was, you know, chatting with, almost, you know, like a huge chunk of them had come through Beekler shop when they first started um I would sort of liken him to like the Roger Corman of the effects world where he was a guy whose door was open for everybody regardless of you know if you've taken classes if you've never taken classes if you're passionate about it and you have some talent John's door was open and he was willing to let you work your way through like building your portfolio and really like finding out who you are as an artist and things like that. And to me, I just thought that was something that was really special because I think, and this isn't a knock against other studios because a lot of those studios are working with like sort of higher end client, like studios and clients and things like that, that had more particular and specific needs where mm -hmm. I understand why like somebody like Stan or Rick, couldn't just do that because like when you're answering for movies that have a 200 million or like a 150 million dollar budget and things like that like you you have to you can only take so many calculated risks where john because he was working a lot in the independent world and things like that like he could take that he could be the guy to give everybody their chance to make a name for themselves and to me i i just thought that that was something very unique and special and when he passed, you know, I was extremely sad about that um, because one, he was a guy like I'd, I'd interviewed him a couple of times um, over the years. And he was just always so genuinely enthusiastic about everything, regardless of what the movie was, how the movie turned out. He was always genuinely happy about being involved because he had such a love for movies and he had such a love of character. Um, and so that to me was really important, but I also just thought because of who he was and what he was able to do for so many people in this industry that I don't think people really knew that. Like I, I, you know, they knew him as the guy who like, you know, did the troll stuff and did Friday seven and things like that. But I don't think they understood like that. He was a guy who basically, when most shops like finish a project, they're like, okay, cool. We'll call you in the next one. And then they push you out the door and you're on your own. John wasn't like mm -hmm. that. Like if he had a crew working and a, sh a show finished up and they didn't have anything immediately, he still kept people on the payroll. He still kept them working on things and pushing them and giving them chances to keep, you know, doing stuff so much. So like, like as Kane pointed out in his interview, like, he took a second mortgage out on his house at one point just to keep people paid in the 2000s because things were so tight in the industry. And he didn't want to have people, you know, these aspiring artists like out there essentially suffering, you know, and trying to figure out what they were going to do. Um, you know, I can't speak to what other people have done. I'm, you know, I'm sure other sacrifices were made. But to me, I, you know, I've worked for, I worked at a special effects shop. I can tell you that the person I worked for never in a million years would have done that. It was like, show's over. See you later. You know, he had a couple of core people who worked at the shop, but like beyond that, like if he brought you in, as soon as that show was done, you're done, you're out. You got to mm -hmm. go find your next, your next gig. Um, so to me, like John was very much sort of this really special person in this industry, you know, not just because of who he was, as a boss or anything like that but just as a human being like there was a real humanity to him and he may not have been 
the most precise artist. I think like in one of the interviews I did with him or did with somebody who worked at his shop, like they talked about like how one time they saw John was sculpting with a fork. Like it wasn't like he was using <laughs> the greatest tools ever, you know, created to make special effects. You know, he was sometimes just like, well, this will work. Let's just do this, <laughs> you know? And, but that was like, that was sort of the charm of it. You know what I mean? And I think in a yeah. lot of ways, like John just made the industry so accessible for so many people um, in ways that I don't think other people were able to. Um, and so I decided like for this one, I wanted to break format a little bit and, you know, celebrate him because he deserved it. I mean, you could write a whole book about his career and his life and like all the different things he's, he did for like, and that's the thing. It's like, all the stories I heard, it was never because it benefited him. It was because it benefited other people. And wow. that's really rare, I think, in Hollywood in general. Like, it's mm -hmm. very much an industry that's ego driven. You know, you have to make results, that kind of stuff. And I don't think he was a guy who really had that kind of ego. Like, I think he just genuinely was happy to be a part of it and being able. And I think he was really happy to be the guy who could give opportunities to so many other people so yeah so i really do in a lot of ways feel like he was the roger corman of effects where you know you you know if you think about the filmmakers and the creators that came out of the roger corman boot camp if you will <laughs> like it's aston astonishing but he was one of those guys like there's like the famous quote where like corman will tell you like you know all right you come in here you work with me you make a couple movies I guarantee when you're done, you will never have to work for me again. And wow. I kind of think Beekler was was very much in a similar vein as that. But I also think at the same time, too, like not to downplay any of the creations, but like there was some really phenomenal work that came out of out of his studios, too, over the years. Um, some really innovative stuff. I think like From Beyond is one that doesn't get talked about a lot. Oh, um, but yeah. Should. You know, I mean, he was the guy that they brought in to do all the gore stuff for for, for Halloween four. Um, I think he's one of the few people that um, I think he might have been involved with almost all of the major franchises, because I know he did Nightmare Friday, Halloween. Um, I wow. don't know uh, if he did a child's play, but I think he did some stuff on one of the Hellraisers. Wow. Yeah. So like and and of course being involved with the Hatchet franchise. Yeah. And like I mean, so. there wouldn't have been Hatchet without him. That's the thing. Wow. Like I, I hope that Adam Green wakes up every day and still thanks his lucky stars that like for a movie with zero budget to get the effects that he did because of John. Like I hope he still appreciates that all these years <laughs> later because we wouldn't have Hatchet. We wouldn't have Victor Crowley if it wasn't for John Crowe Beekler. And the same, and uh, his awesome work on the Ghoulies franchise too, which is like such a fun. That's such a fun project, like what he did with that, and just you know adding his his uh, style to the the you know that franchise. I think that's something that people still talk about today. I mean, I don't think they would have gone to college had it not been for John. So <laughs> even the you know, Ghoulies by, benefited. He's like, if Saved by the Bell can have the college years, so can the Ghoulies. <laughs> <laughs> We should, you know, like, I want to see the gremlins go to college. Like, what, what other creatures can we send uh, to college? Because I'm on board. It's honestly, yeah, I think, you know, that that would have been perfect. And it, yeah, that's and you mentioned, too, with with, um, you know, with with the gremlins and everything. And it's the holiday season right now. Uh, but yeah, I, I love uh, the chapter that you did with with Chris Wallace, um in volume two. And just I mean, that has to be like just hearing the stories about how they made all the gremlins work like on the original film um especially too uh just with like the bar scene and how they had this like labyrinth of tunnels underneath the floor and like all these puppeteers working like that is just so much controlled chaos that it just makes you like when i wa watch those movies again it makes me see them with a whole new appreciation and i also don't know like how did like people like chris like keep their sanity after working um in a project like that with such demanding practical effects yeah i mean honestly like that might be one of the reasons he didn't do the sequel um because i'm sure it was just a really tough thing plus also i think too like artists want to challenge themselves and do things differently but like if you think about it like gremlins 2 was a was a blank check show like that was basically warner brothers handed dante a check and was like do whatever you want 
and you know baker and his crew were able to reap the benefits where in the first one that wasn't the case like they had you know certain parameters they had to work and they had to get really creative on how to like sell gizmo as a character i think even like um and i don't know if we talked about it in the chapter but i i, I do know i remember seeing like an interview with chris from years and years ago um uh, where i was kind of like reviewing like stuff on youtube but he talked about like how there's a scene towards the end of gremlins where gizmo is like supposed to run um around the around the montgomery board store um but you see him and he's kind of on his belly and he's scurrying and it was honestly because they just couldn't figure out how to get the animatronics to work right and they had to get a, they just had to keep moving and oh. you know so he had a lot more stress and a lot more limitations with the stuff that they were able to pull off with gremlins we're like for me i mean gremlins too it's like it's a miracle of a movie like there's so many reasons why i can't even believe that movie exists um but for me like the original gremlins you know you don't have gremlins too without gremlins and the way mm -hmm. that they were able to push things with that movie without having time without having unlimited resources with having to think quickly and react quickly because of like you know production schedules and things like that like what a huge challenge and like you know and it's one of those like i was just i just watched actually both movies because they've been on sci-fi lately which is amazing um but i just watched both of them like last week and just like there's just such a wonderful joy that comes from watching the original gremlins we're like I just, I, I get like why I was I, like, it just completely blew me away as a kid because of like the innovation, like the, just the, the scene alone in the movie theater, like there, there are gremlins in the back of that scene that shouldn't matter. But yet when you're watching that movie, you're completely like you're locked in on them. Like realistically, like you should only care about like the gremlins in the first like two or three rows. Right. But there's ones in the back where you're watching them. And you're like, what is that one doing? <laughs> like, I'm like, what is going on? Like, it's just, it's so much fun. Um, and I love the fact that, you know, they also in, you know, certain sequences that they had to use stop motion because like, how do you do wow. that scene of all the gremlins coming out of the, the YMCA and start running down the street, like without relying on like trying to sell it digitally well here comes stop motion and that's like the and you have to little screen and of everything so it's you know like i respect the hell out of everything that's done at gremlins too because it like it is just a buffet of special effects like there's just it's it, there's so much and it's wonderful and it's lavish and it's all perfect but there's such like i don't want to say scrappy innovation because there's nothing scrappy about the effects in gremlins but there's just such a sense of raw like innovation that's in like the that movie that like I, there's just that's why I love it so much between what Dante was able to achieve as a storyteller and what Chris Wallace was able to do with all these creatures and like you know and then realistically like I know like he, he don't like he hates Gizmo <laughs> <laughs> like it's like the bane of his existence at this point because it was just like it was like the worst character to try to do because the gremlins themselves were so much easier to manage but like but yet like look what that character has become for his career it's it's pretty amazing um and you know but his was also another chapter that I had to sort of adjust a little bit in terms of my approach because he actually um and I think he's talked about this and I think there was something in like an entertainment weekly interview that he did a few years ago for like the 30th anniversary of gremlins, but he actually has like some major hearing loss. Oh. So we, it's really painful for him to sit for interviews. So mm. we actually exchanged emails probably for about 14 months back and forth wow. to do his chapter. Um, because again, it wasn't one of those where I was like, I wasn't going to um, omit him because I couldn't mm -hmm. get on the phone with him. But I was like, OK, so how can we figure this out? You know, so it's not a horrible experience for you, because originally we were going to talk on the phone. And then he sent me this email basically explaining everything. He's like, I just can't. And I was like, you know, Chris, like, that's totally OK. Like, you you owe me zero explanation as it is. But let's figure out how to do this that's comfortable for you. So that's why I had to kind of break a little bit of my typical structure with him as well. 
um, where you're, you're hearing a little bit more from me in his chapter than you are in some of the others, because it just ended up sort of being this back and forth conversation that we had over the course of like a year and a few months. That's amazing. I'm so glad you did that still, because like, kind of like Beekler, he's another guy who ended up directing movies like The Fly 2 after working in the effects world. And I feel like there's just so much, I mean, he's just like a fountain of knowledge and stories in, in Hollywood from working on, you know, some of these huge practical effects showcases. So I'm, I'm really glad that you still found a way to talk with him and, you know, just get those, you know, get those memories of like working with Cronenberg and, and on gremlins. And it's, it's, there's just so much there that I think is, you know, it makes you appreciate it that much more uh, when you read those stories and hear what, uh, what Wayless had to go through in some cases to get the job done. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and again, it's like one of those, like between his work on, you know, gremlins and the fly alone, like, oh, so good. Just, I mean, that's like my childhood right there, you know, <laughs> where I'm just like, there's no way I can't not talk to him and now I'm going to make it work however I can do it. So, and that's the thing like too, like, you know, realistically, like I'm going to have to break structure again for part three um, mm. because one of the chapters is going to be with the Kyoto brothers. Oh, nice. And they're, first of all, they're amazing and I love them and they're, they're so awesome to talk to, but at the same time, like... <laughs> It was a conversation with all three of them at the same time. And it's this instance of where like one will finish the other sentence or <laughs> one will sort of like complete the story from the other. And I'm like, how do I break that up into paragraphs? You just can't. Right. And you just it's like I and it's funny because I actually struggled with that because I don't know. Many people know this, but like prior to the Monsters Makeup and Effects series, like originally this was these interviews were all going to be compiled into like a two volume book from Fangoria. Um, and, but then once they stopped publishing stuff, mm. like I was able to kind of like get everything back and move forward with this project. Um, but I remember when I was put starting to like map out everything for the Fangoria project and, and this is not Phil Noble who said this. So don't anybody be mad at Phil or anything like that. Not that anybody cares, <laughs> but um another person who was involved with the project and I was like they wanted to have like the traditional like paragraph paragraph style which is what I typically do mm -hmm. um but they were and I was just like you guys like I can't figure out how to crack this Kyoto chapter like it's like somebody says a sentence somebody else says a sentence somebody else says a sentence like what am I gonna <laughs> like how do I do this and they were like figure it out and I was like what I was like, you mean I can't like just break <laughs> format for this one? And they're like, no. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay. And I was just like, I don't remember like freaking out, like trying to figure out how to put this together. Like I started that chapter like four years ago. Wow. And I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I'm glad that like <laughs> now I can kind of, I've been able to sort of establish my own style for these books. Um, so I can kind of do that a little bit. Um, and it's interesting too, because I think, a lot of people are sort of surprised a little bit at the style of this, but for me, none of this is about me at all. Um, I know who I am as a writer. I know what I can do. Um, but for me, when it comes to these books, it's, it's all about the people that I'm talking to. So I mm -hmm. actually try to minimize myself as much as possible because when I call them conversations with cinema's greatest artists, I want it to feel like when you're reading this stuff that these people are actually talking to you. I don't need to be part of that necessarily. Like mm -hmm. I'm going to frame it for you and I'm going to set the stage, but then I'm pulling back because I want these people to be front and center. And it was funny because I remember when I sent Kazuhiro his chapter, he was just like, Oh, he's like, I feel like this is too much me. You know, why, why is there so little of your writing? And I was just like, and I was like, Kazu, I was like, none of this is about me. Like, I don't need to put extra words in there to sell, you know, anything. Like, I want this to feel like people are actually talking to you. And he was just like, oh, okay. And I don't think he still gets it to this day. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, that's really the way I, the way I wanted to frame it because it's like, mm -hmm. I'm not, 
I didn't set out to do these books to prove anything about myself as a writer. I mean, other than maybe my enthusiasm for this industry and the fact that these are artists that need to be celebrated, you know, while we still can. Um, but beyond that, like, it's it's all about them. Like, if I'm promoting the book and things like that, like, yeah, I want it to sell, like, but first of all, I'm, I'm never going to maybe in like another 10 years, I might totally break even on this whole process. Maybe. But that's not why I started this. Like I started this because I want these people to get the recognition they deserve. Um, so for me to like pull myself out of these books as much as possible, like that's, that's the goal. Like I don't need to be in there. Like I want people to really feel like they're hanging out with them. Um, so when I'm promoting these things, it's not because I'm trying to hit some sales goal. It's just realistically, I just want people, more people to know and love these people, the way these artists, the way that I've gotten to over the years. Well, I think, yeah, you do a tremendous job of that because I, it definitely feels like an intimate conversation when you read these chapters and it does feel like you're sitting across the table from Kazu or like Michelle Burke and like just hearing these stories of that, you know, if it, it feels like it's almost like like insider knowledge where you're like, man, that's so amazing that you're telling me this. Like, you know, so it does feel like there's that intimacy. And I love, you know, it, it kind of puts yourself in their shoes, too, and seeing how they had to, like, work their way up. And it's so I th and I, that in itself, I think, is a really good skill as a writer, because like, other, you know, it's that sometimes like when you're writing, you can almost get in your own way sometimes. Like when I do, I've done that myself a lot. So like, I think any writer who can do that and almost it's like being a magician where you're like, I'm going to like make it seem like I'm not even here. But at the same time, that takes a lot of work, though, to do that. So it's not as easy as like people might think. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's been a lot. <laughs> I don't even know how to sum it up beyond that. Like, like, if, I, if I had two words to sum up all this, it would be a lot. Well, and one thing I too, I want to mention, um, just because it is the 30th anniversary, but Michelle, the Michelle Burke chapter was just so like, I feel like Michelle Burke needs to have a movie made about her because like she goes, she moves from, from Ireland to Canada. Uh, she ends up winning an Oscar for best makeup along with Sarah Manzani for Quest for Fire, like really early in her career. And then she goes on to win another Oscar for Best Makeup, along with Greg Canham and Matthew W. w. Mungle uh, for her work on Bram Stoker's Dracula, which just turned 30. And like just hearing that, like just how she like literally just worked her way up and like it was not easy, always easy to break into that industry. Like that is like just amazing to read like her story and and the stuff that you put out there about how she you know you know created this these iconic designs and i know the the dracula one was such a risk taker too because it was not the dracula people were used to yeah <laughs> the Mickey Mouse dracula. yeah it's so funny because um yeah it, in a lot of industries in hollywood is no different like it's often you know about who you know right like you if mm -hmm. you know somebody you'll you can get in and things like that where I mean, she had to just blaze her own trail, like from the get go. And, you know, and she did it very unconventionally. She, like she went to Canada. She didn't go to New York. She didn't go to L.A. And then she was working like, you know, in in fashion, makeup and things like that at first and then started to kind of get an interest in doing more things like, you know, makeup effects and things like that. Um, and I just I love the fact that, like, she accepted her Oscar at like the post office because she yes. was on shooting another movie when the Oscar ceremony is going and she's like well there's no way I'm gonna win win this because I'm so new and you know and then, like the postal workers were like tell you know speech speech and they were having her like do that kind of stuff which I just thought was so lovely um but yeah like she's really fascinating because it's like you know I think there's something to be said about taking calculated risks and I think you know if you look at something like Bram Stoker's Dracula like that movie is a movie of calculated risks where it is very traditional in a lot of ways where, you know, it, it's, it's adhering to sort of the classic gism of the Bram Stoker novel and things like that. But I think it pushes um, a lot of things in some very unusual ways that, you know, felt a little like, 
oh, holy crap, back in the 90s. But, you know, people sort of come to accept it. And I do think that, <laughs> that that version of Dracula is part of it. And I always get mad at, like, people who still make fun of it. Or I'm just like, you guys just don't get it. Like, you don't understand. And, like, they'll be like, oh, why would Coppola, like, you know, say yes to this? And I'm like, this is what Coppola wanted. Like, he wanted <laughs> to push things. He didn't want to give you Bella Lugosi. Like, he wanted to give you something that was, like, audacious. Because, like here we are 30 years and we're still talking about it. If he came out, if Gary Oldman came out and he looked like Dracula, Dracula, like who cares? You know, <laughs> exactly. If you, like if you have Gary Oldman, who's willing to just do, you know, go in so many unconventional directions with his character work, like give him this look. Cause he is going to relish it. And, you know, and I, I love what she's been able to do throughout her careers. And like, also like too, like, you know, when I put it together that, you know, she, you know, essentially became sort of like the the makeup artist for Tom Cruise, which, you know, if you look at like what she was able to do in Tropic Thunder, like I still laugh when I think of Les Grossman. Um, <laughs> and then like the work that she and was Austin able Powers. to do. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say on the on the Austin Powers movies, like she's working with some pretty high personality folks. And I'll put it that way. And like the fact that she was able to like get them to trust her and want to keep working with her um is is pretty amazing um and then also i was totally just going to make a point that just totally flew out of my head um <laughs> about her career oh but then it's like but then you look at like the stuff like the cell oh yeah which is like some of the, like extremely haunting body like effects mm -hmm. like that i still i when i still think about the rings in the back Oh. I still cringe like my body tenses up um so it's just it shows you like how how diverse her skill set is in particular you know and it's it's her, her story is amazing I mean I think for me too and it's you know because the industry was a lot different back then like for a woman to come into this industry and win an Oscar so early in her career without people even really knowing who she was and then being able to sort of blaze her path, you know, in, you know, in her career and like be able to do a lot of this really high profile work, you know, as a woman in an industry that was, it probably still is a little bit, I mean, it's better now, but was inherently misogynistic, you know, it mm -hmm. was a boys club for many, many decades because that was just how it was, um, is, is pretty remarkable. And I will say like, to one of the struggles that I've had like throughout this whole series was making sure to get proper representation. And I, I've said this joke for years, but I just didn't want to make white guys the book. Like, yep. because that to me is just really, really boring. So for me, it was really important, you know, as I was doing this to try to one, talk to as many women as I could. And there was quite a few that didn't want to. And I get it because a lot of them ended up leaving the industry and you have to kind of wonder why. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe you don't have to wonder why you kind of just sort of can put that two and two together. Um, but I also wanted to talk to artists from all over the world, like, you know, somebody like David Marti from Spain or, you know, Screaming Mad George, who originally, you know, came from Japan, moved here. Now he's back in Japan, um, you know, and then honestly, in, in terms of like some of the upcoming interviews, like, I might have, you know, some of the original Italian effects guys who are going to oh, be featured nice. in this as well. Um, I think I probably even teased this on my Twitter so I can say it, but like one of the people I spoke <laughs> to, and this was probably about eight months before he passed, was Giannetto De Rossi. Mm. You know? And wow. think about Zombie. Like, think about the yeah. impact oh. of that movie. You know? Yeah, the, and, the iconic imagery that we still reference to this day. Yeah, that's the that's one of my chapters I'm really concerned about because I'm not sure what I'm going to do for materials. Because even it's it's tougher I think to find a lot of BTS stuff from movies not made traditionally here. So that one's going to be a tough one for me. That's that's probably going to be like a very that's probably going to be a few months of research if I can't mm. track stuff down, which is going to be tough, but I'm going to do my best. But you know, but I wanted to make sure that I was like representing people from all over. Um, you know, I, I would admit like one of the people I re reached out to very early on 
who kind of turned me down, which is fine because they've got like their own book and stuff like that. But was Richard Taylor at Weta um, just because of all the stuff that he did very early on with Peter Jackson. And that was basically what gave birth to Weta. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it's so I want to make sure that it's not just a singular experience that people get from these books. Like I want them to get this sort of as as all encompassing as possible experience from all of these stories because you know i just don't want them to feel like it's it's ever like re- like repetitive because once it is like there's no point and i'm out <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> hopefully i don't get to that point of three because then i'm gonna be like oh no and then four is gonna be in trouble well if, if the first two are any indication i think you're you're definitely safe in that department because i what the I think the biggest thing I've learned is like no two pads in the in the makeup and special effects industries are the same. Like as far as how people got to where they are now and the movies they worked on, the experiences, both good and bad that they had along the way. Like even if they were in the same shop, they I've heard like, you know, just totally different perspectives on on working on the same movie. So I think it's it's one of those things where it never it never gets stale because there's always something new like depending on who you're talking to. So I think it's, that's, you know, really interesting. And I can't wait for volume three and to get even, you know, like you mentioned the Italian horror movies and like to get uh, more global too and and continue that that global trek. I think that's going to be really interesting for readers. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just, you know, for me again, it's like one of those things where I'm just, you know, I'm just living out my fandom and doing my best to, <laughs> you know, show people why I care about these people and why they should too. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, so hopefully people come away from these books with the same love and enthusiasm for special effects as I had for them going into this process. You know, that's ultimately like what I want. Like, I think one of my favorite things is whenever somebody says to me like, oh, I did you know, this was really cool because I didn't know this about this or, oh, I'd never even heard of this artist before. And now I'm like, watch, you know, watching the movies that they worked on and realizing like what they did and things like that. So that for me, like when people can come away from this and they've learned something or they've changed their viewpoint or their experiences to a certain degree, like I've won them. Like, that's what I want. Like, you know, it's it's never going to be about like trying to sell a certain amount of books or things like that. I just want people to come away with like some sort of new appreciation. And if that happens, then my, then my, my job is done. Well, it definitely has happened in the case of, of my reading through these. So I think uh, you've definitely, uh, and I know just seeing the reactions online, I think you've definitely achieved that goal and continue to, and I, I can't wait to see what you have in store for the next two volumes. Um, any any final thoughts that you want to share with uh, listeners on on volume two and and what's to come in in the upcoming volumes? Um, gosh, I don't even know at this point. <laughs> but I will <laughs> say that uh, we are having a signing um, at Dark awesome. Delicacies on Sunday, December eleventh at three p.m. Um, I will be joined by a few special effects folks. Um, I'm still waiting on a few confirmations and things like that. I've got a couple maybes, um, but there should be a few people there. Like the one we did for the first book, because we were still kind of coming out of COVID. Um, and there was like a lot of concerns and things like that, which I totally get. So that's not me downplaying it whatsoever. Cause we were all masked and socially distancing from everybody, no pictures and things like that. Um, you know, we were, all, it was just myself and V Neal and Everett's, uh, Oh my god, I was at Everett McGill, like like he was the actor from Silver Bullet. <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was uh, the reverend uh from <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my he brain is so broken. This is what happens when I don't sleep. <laughs> um but we we only had like a you know two two folks were able to come out for that one. Um this one, I'm hoping, you know, we've got three yeses so far. Um I'm thinking I think Dells is gonna be updating their website, but it's really nice because even if you're not in LA. And you want to get a copy and have it shipped. Uh, they will be shipping and they will, and people will receive them in time for Christmas. Um, oh, wonderful. I thought it would, yeah. I just thought it'd be a fun way to like, for like fun little Christmas gifts or something like that. Um, because, you know, who cares about my signature, but like, you know, 
there's, there's some really cool people involved with this. So, you know, so if you're interested in that, you know, if you go to darkdell.com uh, and go to their signings page, uh, you can find out more about that. But it's, uh, as I said, December 11th at 3 p.m. Awesome. Yes. And I highly encourage if you have a horror or sci-fi lover in your life, like get them this book. It is the ultimate stocking stuffer and you will not be disappointed. I mean, it's it's so much fun to read through. Um, Heather, thank you so much for for joining me today. I know we've we've co-hosted a lot of episodes together, but it was really <laughs> fun to have you on as the special guest and to just dive into all this wonderful all these wonderful stories that you've told in Monsters Makeup and Effects. Thank you. Yeah, it's very strange being on the other side of this where I'm just like, <laughs> wait, it's like interview, but I'm the one doing the answering. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> it's very strange for me. <laughs> yeah, I get to see, yeah, just the the other side of uh, of the microphone. But um and and before we go, um, I also want to mention that listeners, if you'd like to order your own copy of Monsters Makeup and Effects Volume 2, as well as Volume 1, uh, be sure to visit aminkpublishing.com, or you can order it on Amazon or on barnesandnoble.com. And to stay updated on all things Monsters Makeup and Effects, uh, be sure to follow the book on Twitter. That's at M-M-E-F-X book, as well as Heather Wixon at The Horror Chick. Uh, and you will always have lots of good updates there. And on that note, um, we want to thank Brian, our engineer, for helping us out every episode. And as always, we want to thank you, our listeners, including those of you who have signed up for Corpse Club membership. Uh, make sure to visit corpseclub.com to check out our latest episode. You can also sign up to become a member, which will give you access to all sorts of ghoulish goodies. Uh, we've got t-shirts, we've got a pin, you can suggest an episode. Uh, we can dive into more makeup effects uh, and, and all sorts of gremlins mayhem if you want us to. Uh, so please uh, visit corpseclub.com. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really does help. You can also find us on Google Play, SoundCloud, and all of your favorite podcast providers. If you want to get in touch, you can reach us anytime at contact at corpseclub.com or on Twitter at Daily Dead News or at Corpse Club, and on Instagram and Facebook under Corpse Club. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay scary.